Clarence House, a hidden gem in the heart of London. Clarence House is lovely. It's like a country house dropped into central London. It's like an oasis that nobody but the royal family knows about. Tucked away on the Mall, just steps from Buckingham Palace, it's been the King's London home for 20 years. It's really quite an intimate house, and I think that's why Charles and Camilla like it. Where his blended family attempted to live together. William and Harry used to sneak in and out of Clarence House so they didn't have to run into Camilla. Once they climbed out of a window to avoid her. And where new family members were introduced. Harry did say that he'd feared there was a moment when Meghan was going to hug Charles. Over its 200-year history, Clarence House has evolved and changed along with its occupants. From William IV, who chose it over Buckingham Palace, to the Queen and Prince Philip, who began married life here. It was an idyll for Elizabeth and Philip. They loved it. And it was famously the Queen Mother's home for more than 50 years. Every day was a party in Clarence House. Clarence House has sheltered the royal family through good times. Clarence House becomes really a place of joy for Margaret. And bad. It was actually quite a lonely experience for Diana. And somehow it's managed to keep its secrets hidden. There were always stories of footmen and people just being found lying on the floor, dead drunk. There was a lot of bed hopping. Clarence House may not be well known to the public, but for the royal family, it's where they feel free to be themselves. It's such a fascinating house because people have put their personal stamp on it. I think this is where the mask comes off. King Charles III's coronation in May 2023 was steeped in centuries of tradition. But there was one ancient ritual going back a thousand years that the new king had no intention of keeping. There is a tradition that the night before the coronation, the incoming monarch should spend the night in the state bed in the Palace of Westminster. Instead, King Charles and Queen Camilla had a quiet dinner together at their much-loved London home, Clarence House. Completely understandably, the king decided to stay in his own bed before the biggest day of his life. Clarence House has been the royal couple's official residence for over 20 years. But Charles first lived here when he was just a toddler, before his mother became queen. And throughout his life, he was a frequent visitor to his beloved grandmother, the Queen Mum, who lived there for nearly half a century. He loves Clarence House. That was where he wanted to be for the last night before his coronation. It was almost like a thank you for Clarence House for getting him through his life before. But even though Clarence House is so important to the king, it's surprisingly unknown by the public. It's hidden in plain sight set in the most beautifully laid out large gardens and it's been a place of refuge for royal family for a very long time. So where exactly is Clarence House and what royal secrets does it hold? Clarence House is a few hundred yards away from Buckingham Palace. Obviously everyone and all the tourists flood to the gates of the palace and look at that, in my view, rather ugly building. But just down the road, there is this beautiful white house set back from the Mall, and that is Clarence House. This four-storey Georgian townhouse is connected to the southwest corner of St James's Palace on the north side of the Mall. It's surprisingly private for somewhere that is smack bang in the middle of London. They could be having receptions or lunches in the gardens there and no one would know that just the other side of the wall, <laughs> there are the royals. On the ground floor, Clarence House has five reception rooms. The garden room, the Lancaster room, the dining room, the library and the morning room. Charles and Camilla come in the main entrance and then the palace opens up. On the left is the morning room, which is decorated in blue. Although Charles redecorated when he moved in, the rooms still look a lot like they did when the Queen Mother lived there. We have this lovely pale blue colour palette and that's actually what the Queen Mother chose because it's the Strathmore Racing Colours. We saw William and Kate have their engagement interview in this room. 
Much of the artwork in the Blue Morning Room was the Queen Mum's, including a painting by Claude Monet that she paid £2,000 for in 1945 and is now worth millions. The Lancaster Room is to the right of the front door. It's often used as a waiting room for guests. And then on the left, as you go down, there's the library with all Charles's books and often he'll have his afternoon tea there and at the back, the dining room. A large portrait of Charles's grandmother as a young woman hangs over the fireplace in the dining room. The garden room is at the front of the house on the right-hand side. With the Prince of Wales harp and a baby grand piano, it's a favourite for entertaining. Noel Coward and Princess Margaret used to play this baby grand piano and you can just imagine them sitting around in the room with the Queen Mother over at a gin and Dubonnet together enjoying a great evening. Upstairs there are private sitting rooms and five family bedrooms. Charles and Camilla have separate rooms on the same floor. And perhaps somewhat surprisingly, Princess William and Harry also had bedrooms there when they were home from university and the army. We look back now in the knowledge that William and Harry lived there as well with Charles and Camilla. We sort of think, oh my goodness, well, how did that work? It must have been quite difficult, actually, to have some late teen boys with Charles and his long-term girlfriend, essentially. Harry and William would often say to the servants, is she here? And they would groan if the answer was yes. William and Harry used to sneak in and out of Clarence's house so they didn't have to run into Camilla. They would use the servants' quarters to get in and out of the house once they climbed out of a window to avoid her. They also used to sneak in and out of Clarence's house for a different reason. It became party central, particularly when they knew that Charles and Camilla were at their other homes. When the cats were away, the boys played. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think they went on all night and into the early morning. <laughs> William finally moved out of Clarence House after his marriage in 2011, and Harry followed a year later. His room was then converted into a dressing room for Camilla, which quite upset the prince. Harry has written about how he felt quite hurt, quite put out. He says, I try not to care, I try not to care, but he did care. Clarence House isn't just a family home, it's also a busy workplace. It's not only full of domestic staff who keep the house running, but also where the King and Queen's private secretaries and equerries are based. Not to mention representatives from royal causes and charities working in ground floor offices at the back of the building. It's slightly chaotic. There's a lot of people in a relatively small space. It's very difficult to combine the personal and the public as successfully as I think has been combined at Clarence House. As Prince of Wales, Charles would invite foreign leaders to tea at Clarence House on the first day of a state visit. Charles is a brilliant diplomat. When President Trump came for his first state visit, we were all agog. How would the climate denier in chief get on with Charles, the climate change activist. The visit started with a group photo in the morning room. And as Charles took Donald Trump through into the main bit of Clarence House, Camilla turned to us and just gave us a wink, as if to say, it's all going to be OK. And it was. Charles charmed Donald Trump. Now that he's king, Charles conducts much of his official business at Buckingham Palace. But more than a year into his reign, Charles and Camilla are still living in Clarence House. Certainly for Charles, Clarence House is his main residence and that's where he prefers to be. That's where he prefers to see courtiers, that's where he prefers to have meetings. Clarence House has become that little slice of heaven where they can be themselves rather than... Uh, royals performing for the public. Today, Clarence House is firmly established as a beloved private home for the King and Queen. But some royals have despised Clarence House. So who exactly didn't want to live there? Clarence House might now be the home of King Charles and Queen Camilla, but it was originally built to help rescue the reputation of a future king.
Clarence House is built for a man who was called at the time Billy Clarence, but his proper name was His Royal Highness William, Duke of Clarence. He later became King William IV. He was the third son of George III and Queen Charlotte. He wasn't expected to inherit the throne. He'd acquired the nickname Silly Billy because he wasn't thought to be the greatest intellect. To the Georgian public, William was best known as a playboy prince. As a younger man, he'd had 10 illegitimate children. But by 1825, when he started building Clarence House, William was 60 years old and respectably married to the German princess, Adelaide of saxe meiningen For the first years of their marriage, they lived in a small, rather run-down house that was part of St. James's Palace. William didn't like living in St. James's Palace. He thought it was a bit cramped. William wanted to build a grand home that reflected his status as a recently married brother of King George IV and he picked a prime location to do so. Clarence House would stand in one of the most elegant areas of Georgian London. You've got the old Palace of Westminster, then you've got Buckingham Palace, and you've got St James's Palace, and then Clarence House next to St James's. So it's a fantastic location. Clarence House really was put at the hub of fashionable London, and certainly royal fashionable London at the time. And for such a project, William chose the most fashionable architect of the day, John Nash, the man behind Regent Street, the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, and the massive expansion of Buckingham Palace. He was a real theatrical architect. He could pull tricks as to how to turn corners, how to create a great urban sweep, a brilliant staircase that just thrills you. He's a, such a good architect. Nash demolished William's old house, as well as several other dilapidated buildings on the site, and built an elegant stucco mansion for William and Adelaide. Although it joined St James's Palace, he made no effort to match its ancient brick exterior. Clarence House is uh, like a meringue that's been dropped. It looks like a piece of a terrace from West London. Belgravia has been pulled up by a crane and dumped on the edge of St James's Palace. To try and blend in with old St James's, I think, would have defeated the point for an upwardly mobile brother of a monarch. The finished house cost £22,000, about £3 million today, considerably more than Nash's original budget. The multiplication of costs is typical in Nash's projects. In this case, it went from eight to £9,000 up to a final bill of £22,000. All being said, that's something of a bargain for Nash's work. It was a beautiful home, but not as impressive as Clarence House today. Originally, it was three floors and a basement, rather than four, with its main entrance facing west to Stable Yard Road. The entrance hall lay where the library is today, and the dining and breakfast rooms were on either side. These were accessed via a long corridor that ran parallel to the road. The house was decorated very simply by Georgian royal standards. There's not a great amount of lavish interior decorating. The furniture's all quite sombre and mahogany. It's very serious. William and Adelaide moved into Clarence House in 1827, but it wasn't the only significant event of that year for the prince. 1827 is the year that changes William's life forever. His elder brother, Frederick, the Duke of York, dies, which moves William up the line of succession. When George IV dies, William will be king. So suddenly, uh, the third son is much more important, and Clarence House is representative of his new status. He's reinvented himself from the unknown sailor, Silly Billy, to the heir to the throne. But it wasn't just his reputation that William needed to worry about. His brother, King George IV, was despised by the public. William would need to rebuild the reputation of the monarchy. It's quite difficult for us to appreciate just how unpopular the monarchy was in the 1820s. George IV is a deeply, deeply unpopular man. He's seen as extravagant, gluttonous and self-indulgent. So William and Adelaide spend these three years worrying and planning about what they will inherit when George IV dies. 
King George IV died on the 26th of June, 1830. The 64-year-old Duke of Clarence was now King William IV, the oldest person to come to the British throne until Charles III. Now, William had a choice to make. As king, should he stay in Clarence House or move to the much larger Buckingham Palace, which was in the final stages of Nash's renovation? William, when he became king, wanted to stay in Clarence House. He loved Clarence House. He didn't want to move to Buckingham Palace. He saw it as a symbol of his elder brother, George IV, who had been very extravagant in renovating it. Instead of moving, William modified Clarence House to make it more suitable for a monarch. He actually had a corridor made between Clarence House, over a carpenter's workshop, into the state apartments of St James's Palace, so that he could just cross through and go to the state functions at St James's without moving out of Clarence House. He found it to be uh, a place to, to rule and have as his sort of working palace, but also as his home. Staying in the more modest Clarence House signalled William's desire to be a very different king to his older brother. William was seen as capable hands after the excesses of his brother's ten years as king. So William IV becomes the stabilising influence. You do see the monarchy not exactly flourish, but certainly it stops losing support and it starts to slowly rebuild it. Inside Clarence House, William was also dealing with some major family drama involving his sister-in-law, the mother of his heir. William and Adelaide's children had not lived past infancy, so his heir was his niece, Victoria. She was the daughter of his younger brother, Edward, who had died when she was a baby. As a young princess, Victoria was, of course, raised by her mother, the Duchess of Kent. But she did not get along very well with the king. The relationship between William and the Duchess was really strained, really problematic. There wasn't a great deal of appreciation, affection or respect between them. Victoria's mother used it as an excuse that Victoria could not go to Clarence House to spend time with King William and Queen Adelaide because the king entertains his illegitimate children there. William responded to these insults by publicly announcing he was determined to live until Victoria reached 18 to thwart any chance of her mother ruling as regent. He pretty much says to his doctors, he says, just wind me up, just keep me going, wind me up until she is 18. William did manage to hang on until Victoria had turned 18. Just a month after Victoria came of age, William died and she became the next queen. William died in 1837. He would have been pleased to know his hated sister-in-law was quickly pushed into the background by her daughter, the new queen. He might have been less happy to learn where she was exiled to. I can't imagine William IV would have been thrilled to know that after his death in 1837, Queen Victoria would give Clarence House to his sister-in-law and enemy, the Duchess of Kent. He would have been furious. The new queen didn't want to live in Clarence House herself. She preferred the newly renovated Buckingham Palace. Queen Victoria becomes associated very much with Buckingham Palace and that becomes her principal residence. And in that sense, we see the transition of Buckingham Palace as the kind of monarchy's HQ. Victoria was desperate to escape the mother who had controlled every aspect of her childhood. She wasn't allowed to walk downstairs on her own. She wasn't allowed to sleep on her own. She wasn't allowed to be alone for a minute. It was a stifling environment, so as soon as Victoria could, she was off to Buckingham Palace and separating her household from her mother. She decided that a good way to have her mother close, but not too close, was to give her her base in Clarence House. I think Clarence House was the ideal solution, actually. The Queen could keep an eye on her. <laughs> she would probably keep an eye on the Queen. Nevertheless, Victoria's mother was extremely hurt by her daughter's decision. The Duchess of Kent's time at Clarence House was not a happy time for her. She did not like being shut out of Victoria's life. It was really a place for the Duchess that symbolised how she played the game to get power and she'd lost. She didn't want to be in a house that had been owned by her mortal enemy, William IV. The Duchess stripped out William's plain interiors and redecorated in classic Victorian style. 
I can absolutely imagine that she didn't want anything that reminded her of the king who had beat her at the game. She had much more gold and much more bling and much more clutter. Clarence House remained the Duchess's London home for the rest of her life. Victoria's relationship with her mother did thaw over the years, and I think the separation of their households with the Duchess living at Clarence House was probably a key factor for that. In 1866, five years after her mother died, Queen Victoria handed the keys to Clarence House to one of her nine children, 22-year-old Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh. Affy, as he was known, was Queen Victoria's second son after Edward, Prince of Wales. He likes it and doesn't change it, but then he conceives a very, very grand love match. He has a great passion for the Tsar of Russia's daughter, Princess Marie, and she has lived in these vast imperial palaces. Marie would have grown up in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, which is massive. It has 117 staircases, over 2,000 windows, all sorts of bling that you can possibly imagine. To bring your bride back to Clarence House is really to show her the boot room of a Russian palace. And so he did his best. Alfred was a man in love, and he saw Clarence House as the means by which he could prove his worth, prove his love, and essentially create a home fit for his bride. Alfred embarked on a massive project to renovate Clarence House. He used a builder called Waller. He wasn't even an architect, but Waller expanded this house and put in galleries with new panelling. Alfred really makes an effort with these changes for Maria. A floor is added to increase the space. There's really a complete gutting of certain parts of the interior to add in longer, grander rooms. Alfred added a grand double portico entrance on the south side and extended the house to the east, fully connecting it to St James's Palace. It's much more like the Clarence House we know today. And he also added a whole new chapel for his wife to worship the Russian Orthodox Chapel. Affy constantly is trying to make the house bigger and grander, but whatever he does, the house is never grand enough for his very, very grand wife. Oh, my goodness, it was small potatoes to her. Clarence House was intended to be this ultimate wedding gift, so full marks for his effort, but ultimately it didn't really impress his new bride. Alfred died in 1900, and Clarence House returned to the gift of Queen Victoria. Clarence House became exceedingly popular among the royal family. Everyone wants to live there. And indeed, the Prince of Wales himself wanted Clarence House, the future Edward VII. But the Queen gave the house to her seventh child, her favourite son, Arthur, and his wife, Louise, the Duke and Duchess of Connaught. But Louise was in poor health and died in Clarence House in 1917. Arthur took up various postings abroad and spent very little time in the house from then on. Without Louise's influence, the care for Clarence House really goes quite to seed. Arthur simply isn't that interested in it. And as a result, when he passes away in 1942, the royal family realised that there's been a quarter century of neglect since Princess Louise's death. Clarence House really became a rather shuttered, quiet, dusty and neglected royal house. There would be more years of neglect before Clarence House became home to a new generation of royals. And for this formerly much-loved house, enormous challenges lay ahead. The years from 1942 do nothing to stop the rot of the house. In fact, it accelerates. Arthur, Duke of Connaught, Queen Victoria's favourite son, died in 1942 in the middle of World War II. Suddenly, Clarence House found itself part of the war effort. King George and Queen Elizabeth become the royal symbols of British... After the Duke of Connaught died, there was no next royal occupant. It was actually the British Red Cross and St John's Ambulance that took over Clarence House. And there were 200 members of staff based there, and their job was to enable communications with prisoners of war. So. This royal palace was put at the disposal of the nation and served a very useful and valuable purpose. The years from 1942 do nothing to stop the rot of the house. In fact, it accelerates, along with being used by the Red Cross. There's also bomb damage that has happened during the Nazi aerial attacks on London. In World War II, the royal palaces were a target. They were 
very obvious they were in central London and there was a lot of bomb damage around the area of the Mall and so Clarence House although it didn't suffer a direct hit it was a target and it did have bomb damage there. In 1947, two years after the war ended, Clarence House once again became home to a future monarch when it was given to newlyweds Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Elizabeth and Philip marry in 1947 in this beautiful wedding and they are given Clarence House as their first home. And what a wonderful first home for a new couple, you might think. How lovely, so convenient, so beautiful, just next to Buckingham Palace. But Clarence House needs a lot of work. It really was in a terrible state. And so Prince Philip really rolled up his sleeves and got to work and he loved the challenge. For Prince Philip, this was an opportunity to create his first proper home. As a member of the Greek royal family, he had lived in exile since he was a baby. Philip had this nomadic existence as, as a young man. So this was his chance, not only to properly settle down, but to make the home that he'd wanted. Philip had spent much of World War II deployed at sea and was still serving as a first lieutenant in the Royal Navy when he took command of the Clarence House renovations. The three big phases in the life of Clarence House have been delivered by naval men, ultimately. So you're talking about William, at the first builder, and then Alfred in the 1870s, and then Prince Philip after World War II. All of them practical naval men who update appropriately as they see it. They get the job done. Well, being a naval man, he was also quite controlling and he got very involved in the renovations and he even had, I think he even invented some little things of his own. He had a secret button when you pressed it, a cupboard appeared. He loved science and he loved technology. He wanted all the mod cons. He wanted a proper modern working kitchen with all the gadgets. I mean, he had an intercom system put in. He was a modern man. He wanted a modern house. Modernising Clarence House meant rewiring the whole building, adding central heating and up-to-date plumbing. There was only one proper bathroom at that point and putting in a new kitchen, not to mention repairing the bomb damage to the roof. And when it came to redecorating, Princess Elizabeth took a hands-on role. She used to mix the paint. This is only just post-war. And paint colours were very limited. So Elizabeth actually, to get it a bit different, mixed the paint herself. Doing a major renovation right after World War II brought any number of challenges. Of course, at that time, much of London had been bombed. Tens of thousands of people were homeless. Everything was still rationed. Obviously, London had so much rebuilding to be done. So the price of materials, availability, everything was really pressured. There was a real need to keep to budget and be accountable for every penny spent, just like the rest of London were having to do. The final cost of the renovation was £55,000, around £2 million today. Much of the money was spent on repairing the house rather than creating an opulent royal palace. There really wasn't much bling or excess at all. It was furnished in a very modest fashion. They put in things like you know, three-piece suite, wall-to-wall -wall carpets, lamps that your nan might recognise. I mean, all of this mid-20th century stuff went in and actually added quite a charming mid-century domestic character to this. The Duke of Edinburgh's study, it's really quite simple. It is a nice wooden panelling from Canada, an angle poised lamp which he took with him wherever he was, and a very spanking new white telephone. The young couple were able to keep the budget down thanks to some very generous wedding presents. It could be slightly awkward if, after the war years, you move into a house and say, do you know what, I'd really love a cinema in the basement. Well, that was Prince Philip's ambition, but... What if you have a list of wedding gifts you might quite like? So the cinema was gifted to him. The Canadians gave him maple to line the walls in a suitably light, modern um, style. And so much of the house was actually funded by wedding presents. In the summer of 1949, Clarence House was finally ready for Elizabeth and Philip to make the move down the Mall from Buckingham Palace, where they had been living with her parents, the King and Queen. 
The Edinburghs, as they were known, were now a family of three. Prince Charles had been born the previous year. And in August 1950, Princess Anne arrived. Princess Anne was actually born at Clarence House, in one of the bedrooms upstairs. News of her birth was posted on the gate outside. The new princess was born at 11.50am and weighed six pounds exactly. Gun salutes were fired across London in celebration. She was, by Philip's description, a sweet little girl. He was absolutely thrilled. He drank champagne with the staff. He rang the king, who was up at Balmoral. The early years of marriage have set the seal on the happiness of the princess and her husband. Life at Clarence House, in the early years of the royal marriage with the two children, it was an idyll for Elizabeth and Philip. They loved it. They loved the house they created. They loved having their own home. Elizabeth and Philip actually had adjoining bedrooms, and they made sure that their dressing tables were positioned right next to the doors. This meant that when they were getting ready and they'd be able to sit and chat, and joke. And every morning, Philip, who was an early riser, came into the bedroom of Elizabeth and present her with her morning breakfast and newspapers. And this was observed by Philip's valet, who thought it was rather an extraordinary scene to, you know, often come across half-naked Philip in bed with Elizabeth. <laughs> They had a really jolly, happy household, as a young couple should do. You know, they were just learning the royal ropes and their staff were learning what to do and they all kind of worked together. The staff quarters were newly renovated too, with fitted carpets and hot running water. Not a given in houses at that time. And there were only three million televisions in the whole of Britain at that time and the staff in Clarence House had their own television set in their staff quarters. They had the luxury of having their bed sheets changed regularly by the chambermaids and supplied with new towels. So the staff were very happy working for Philip and Elizabeth at Clarence House. For both the servants and the family, royal life at Clarence House was not nearly as formal as at Buckingham Palace. Charles and Anne used to have the run of the house and we do think that the state of the art kitchen was such that Elizabeth herself did quite a bit of cooking in there. The children had several nannies, but Elizabeth would arrange her royal duties so she was at home to help with bath time. Philip came to work at the Admiralty, just literally down the road, and it was not unusual for Elizabeth to wait at the window, as it were, for the return of Philip, who often walked to and fro work. This paints a very normal picture of married life for the royals, because there must have been women like Elizabeth all over London and the country waiting in the evening for the return of their husband from work. And it does paint a rather idyllic picture, you know, the calm, if you like, before the storm. Elizabeth and Philip might have imagined their tranquil family life at Clarence House would continue for decades to come. But less than three years after they moved in, tragedy struck. On the 6th of February 1952, the King died at Sandringham and the world changed for Elizabeth and Philip overnight. The King's death came as a huge shock. Elizabeth was now Queen at just 25 years old. Elizabeth was thrust into the spotlight, suddenly became queen, still a young woman, a newly married woman. And at that point, the sort of family domestic oasis of Clarence House was really shattered. The new queen and her family were expected to move to Buckingham Palace, home to every monarch since Queen Victoria. Prime Minister Winston Churchill made it clear they had no choice. They really desperately wanted to stay at Clarence House, but Churchill said no. No, the monarch has to live as head of state at Buckingham Palace. I think Philip was utterly dismayed about that prospect. And he didn't want to leave Clarence House. You know, he'd just spent several years sorting it all out, modernising it, making it what he wanted. Like William IV long before them, Philip and Elizabeth did not want to move to Buckingham Palace upon Elizabeth's succession. Unlike William IV, they did give in to the pressure for tradition and move there. It was said that when they finally had to leave Clarence House for the last time, there wasn't a dry eye in the car. They all turned back for their last 
glimpse at Clarence House. And I suppose their last glimpse of real freedom and normality. It was the end of an era for Clarence House as well. The house was about to be at the centre of a scandal that would rock the royal family. All hell broke loose. When Queen Elizabeth and her family reluctantly moved to Buckingham Palace in 1953, Clarence House wasn't left empty. After they moved out, her newly widowed mother and sister, Princess Margaret, soon moved in. This is the property swap that pleases absolutely nobody. The Queen Mother was one of the very few royals who actually quite liked Buckingham Palace and would have preferred to stay. I think that Clarence House must have seemed rather small for Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. She apparently said something along the lines, it's a ghastly little hovel, it was pokey. She was used to Buckingham Palace. She complained it was a bit small, but she was impressed by the fact that it was so modern. And it was only a matter of time of her bringing all her wonderful pictures and furniture into the house to make it feel like home. But for 23-year-old Princess Margaret, the move was devastating. Margaret, heartbroken to leave Buckingham Palace, heartbroken at the death of her father, when the king died, Margaret suddenly goes from the king's daughter to the queen's younger sister, shunted out of Buckingham Palace to Clarence House with her mother, who, by all accounts, they didn't all always see eye to eye. There were a lot of tensions between them. They had very different attitudes to life, to what royal service should be, how you should speak to people and deal with people. And as a result, there were quite a few spats at Clarence House between the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. Life at Clarence House did bring one consolation for Margaret. In the aftermath of her father's death, Margaret became very close to her father's equerry. Peter Townsend, who after her father's death was appointed comptroller of the Queen Mother's household. Peter Townsend was a Royal Air Force veteran and had fought at the Battle of Britain during the Second World War. He was handsome, conscientious and well-liked. But Townsend wasn't a suitable match for the Queen's sister. Not only was he 15 years older and an employee of her mother, he was recently divorced with two children, a taboo for royals at that time. However, Townsend's new position at Clarence House meant he and Margaret could keep their growing relationship secret. Clarence House became that sanctuary for these lovers where they could really be happy. It's inevitable that Margaret falls in love with him. He's there, he's kind, she has no one else to see, she's in mourning, and he understands her father. The proximity of Peter and Margaret together certainly was explosive. When the news finally broke about their relationship, Clarence House became the centre of a media storm. All hell broke loose. Everyone's saying, what's going on here? And Margaret says she wants to marry Peter Townsend. The rumours and headlines whether she'll wed RAF Group Captain Peter Townsend spread over... This is a problem. He is a commoner. He's divorced. As Margaret was under 25, she needed the Queen's permission to marry and there was no way it would be granted. I think the Queen really wanted her sister's happiness, but the trouble was the Queen, head of the Church of England, and marrying a divorcee, at that time, it wasn't thought appropriate. Townsend was exiled from Clarence House until Margaret was old enough to make her own decision. It would be 1955 before he returned. At that point, Margaret was given an ultimatum, and it was essentially, you either choose him and give up all your royal status and titles, or you accept the fact that to be a member of the royal family, it means giving up and sacrificing the prospect of marriage to a man who is a divorcee. When Peter came back, he visited Margaret in Clarence House, and time had taken its toll, because they realised they couldn't fight the inevitable. They had to part company. In a personal message from Clarence House, the princess said, I would like it to be known that I have decided not to marry Group Captain Peter Townsend. I think she was terrified. She knew, hang on a minute, I've been told that I can marry Townsend, but I can't be HRH anymore. And she thought, 
well, I'm nothing without that. And so she chose the gilded cage rather than Townsend. He said his final goodbye to Margaret in the gardens of Clarence House. So she falls in love with Peter Townsend in Clarence House and then she gives him up in Clarence House and lives alone there. Heartbreaking. I think that's the key to the role of Clarence House in the private personal lives of the royal family. It is that haven where they live, but where they also love and where they also deal with loss. Margaret was now settled into life at Clarence House. She had her own rooms, including a drawing room overlooking the garden, with her lady-in-waiting's office next door. She had extremely nice quarters at Clarence House. She had her own staff, she had her own dogs, she had the use of the garden, and it was easier to come and go than it had been at Buckingham Palace. She liked a rather grand lifestyle, so Margot would get up at about 11 in the morning and would be prepared by her dresser and then would appear at about 12.30 with a fresh glass of orange juice on her desk and her correspondence laid out for her. Her life at Clarence House was focused completely on getting through the day and then having a fun time at night. With Townsend no longer in her life, Margaret was intent on having a good time. Princess Margaret delighted in the gaieties of a social life. She liked parties and dancing. She didn't really have anything to lose because she'd lost the thing that she had, which was the man she loved. And so she wanted to live her life in search of as much happiness as she could get. Clarence House became the place to be. Everybody and anybody, socialite celebrities, would want to be with Margaret at Clarence House. It was the ultimate ticket in town. Margaret enjoyed performing and would often sing for her guests. She was surrounded by people who inevitably told, oh, my dear, you're so wonderful, you're such a great voice. She was singing one evening, surrounded by these adoring friends and celebrities, and one of them, unfortunately, was the painter Francis Bacon. And while uh, Margaret was singing, he just shouted, get off, you can't sing a note. And apparently she flushed absolutely crimson and left the stage. And that was said to be the only time in her life when anyone ever did that. In 1958, a glamorous high society photographer became part of Margaret's Clarence House circle. She meets this dashing Welsh photographer, the talk of the town, Anthony Armstrong Jones. He does a photo shoot with her and she's interested in the fact that he's quite informal with her and sort of tells her what to do and she's, <laughs> she's not used to that. And he's got a very powerful sexual magnetism, Anthony Armstrong Jones. Margaret invited him to lunch at Clarence House, warning she was planning to bore him by showing him a photograph she had taken of her mother. Clearly, Armstrong Jones wasn't bored, and the relationship progressed quickly. So there's a pull between them, but she's able to carry on this affair quite quietly from 1958 until really 1959, because he's just one of the party set. Once again, Clarence House gave Margaret the privacy to fall in love, without the public watching her every move. Tony Armstrong Jones used to go and collect Princess Margaret from Clarence House, and then she'd get on his motorbike, and they'd go to Rotherhithe, where he had a flat overlooking the river. And he used to cook a meal, and they'd have a drink. Now, you can imagine the contrast, a Rotherhithe flat from the palatial surroundings of Clarence House and the Queen Mother. She loved it. Margaret wasn't the only Clarence House resident who enjoyed Armstrong Jones's company. The Queen Mother seemed to love having him around. I think the Queen Mother was rather bowled off her feet, too, by the dashing Tony. The Queen Mother threw a party and directed her younger daughter Margaret and Tony to form this conga line all through Clarence House, up and down the stairs, out into the garden. I mean, yeah, that party went down in history. This must have been absolutely hysterically funny. Queen Mum was just so happy that her daughter, who had been a real worry for her, how she was conducting her life, her endless partying, her drinking... And finally, I think for the Queen Mum, Tony provided that hope that she would settle down, get married and have children and have a happy family life. Margaret married Anthony Armstrong Jones on May the 6th, 1960. The bride left Clarence House in a fairy tale horse-drawn carriage. 
Clarence House just has so many kind of character changes. And it's another one from being this great arena for social events that when Margaret is this girl about town to them being this place where she sort of takes her final breath as a single woman preparing to go and be married at Westminster Abbey. She left Clarence House looking radiant like Cinderella going to her ball in this glass carriage and it was exactly what Margaret wanted and needed. She was the centre of attention. She really cut such a striking figure with her equally dashing husband. There was 20 million UK viewers, 100 million plus around the world. The newlyweds lived at Clarence House until their apartments in Kensington Palace were ready. In November 1961, their first child, David, was born there. Clarence House has also been an operating theatre. Princess Margaret had a caesarean section in Clarence House. Whether we see that as kind of quite reckless or, or quite modern and quite relaxed, I don't know. But it was quite striking, I think, the actual idea that there would be surgery that she knew was going to happen and it was going to happen also at Clarence House. Shortly after, Margaret and her family moved out, leaving the Queen Mother alone in Clarence House. It would be nearly 20 years before she was joined there by a new, very popular member of the royal family in February 1981. When Diana, the Princess of Wales, got engaged, she was immediately the centre of the world's attention. She couldn't move for cameras and press all around her. So I think for her own safety, it was decided that she couldn't stay in the flat that she loved with her friends, her flatmates, and she had to move immediately, really, to Clarence House. Living with the 80-year-old Queen Mother was a huge adjustment for Diana, who was only 19 at the time. It was actually quite a lonely experience for Diana and perhaps the sort of start of where reality started to dawn on what this future life as a royal bride might actually be. I spoke to her about this actually. I said you were at Clarence House. Were you sort of taken under the Queen Mother's wing? And she said absolutely not. She said I didn't even see her. I didn't see her. I just was taken up to my room and that was that. Infamously when Diana got to Clarence House there was something waiting for her on the bed. It was a letter from Camilla Parker Bowles, at that point married to Andrew Parker Bowles, and a friend of Charles's. The letter was an invitation to lunch. Looking back years later, Diana believed Camilla was trying to find out when she would be able to meet Prince Charles in secret. We have to remember that Diana's telling us this 10, 12 years hence. A lot of water has gone under the bridge by this point. She's split up from Charles. Camilla and Charles have, have got back together and Diana was very, very angry about it. Diana spent just three nights at Clarence House before quietly moving to rooms at Buckingham Palace. But on the 28th of July, on the eve of her wedding, she returned to Clarence House. She had supper with her sister Sarah there and she says that she was very, very nervous, ate too much and then was violently sick. She didn't sleep very well, but I suspect that was as much to do with stress as to do with the noise of people cheering and singing all night outside. The next morning, Diana climbed into the glass coach, her enormous wedding dress squashed around her and was driven away from Clarence House. Diana's entrance into the public consciousness as a member of the royal family really starts that journey out of Clarence House. Hundreds of millions of viewers see those shots of Clarence House and the coach departing and the first tiny glimpses of the soon-to-be very famous wedding dress. Once again, the Queen Mother was the only royal at Clarence House. But that didn't mean she was lonely. Stories of footmen and people just being found lying on the floor, dead drunk. To many members of the public, Clarence House will always be the home of its longest and most beloved resident. For anybody of a certain age, when we think of Clarence House, we think of the Queen Mother. Although she moved in only four years after Elizabeth and Philip's renovation, the Queen Mother completely redecorated Clarence House, making it look much as it does today. Gone were the fitted carpets, and in came Persian rugs with gilded 
furniture very often. You could tell that this was a grand house for a grand lady. The Queen Mother added double doorways between the reception rooms to make it easier to host large numbers of guests. And when Princess Margaret moved out, she knocked two of her daughter's rooms together to create the garden room, where she often entertained important visitors. The Queen Mother very much wanted to keep her finger on the button of world affairs and domestic affairs. And so when she moved into Clarence House, it became a tradition that on the first day of a state visit, an incoming president or whatever would go around for tea, tea and buns with the Queen Mother at Clarence House. One of the Queen Mother's favourite state visits took place in 1996 when President Nelson Mandela called for tea at Clarence House. They apparently ended up talking so long over tea that President Mandela and the Queen Mother were late for every other event in the itinerary that day. Queen Elizabeth wouldn't have dared scold her mother for delaying the visit. She was very influential over her daughter because she was such a strong character. Everything was light and frothy and entertaining, but underneath it, there was a woman of steel. As Clarence House was the Queen Mother's home, as well as a stage for her public duties, she made sure it reflected her personal interests. Horse racing was a massive part of the Queen Mother's life. She absolutely loved it. She started as quite a young woman, collecting paintings and drawings of horses. So she created a corridor in Clarence House with all these wonderful paintings. She called it the Horse Corridor. I was told that she had a tannoy system installed at Clarence House. She could keep across every commentary of, of, of every race meeting in the country. And perhaps she even sent one of the servants to put a little flutter on her favourite horse. It was never really talked about, the Queen Mother's love of betting. With a certain amount of assistance, the Queen Mother follows racing all over the country. But of course she put money on. I think it was very much part of Clarence House life. One of the most important events in the Clarence House calendar was the Queen Mother's annual birthday celebration on August the 4th. I'd arrive early in the morning and there'd be huge crowds already. Many, many people would have camped out outside the gates of Clarence House to greet her because she was very good with the public. I think the highlight of the birthdays for the Queen Mother was the moment at Clarence House that the Guild of Toastmasters would arrive with the most enormous bottle of champagne you've ever seen. Toastmasters had lugged along the biggest possible bottle of champagne. And it would be opened with great ceremony and the Queen Mother would enjoy her first tipple of the day. <laughs> After greeting the public, the Queen Mother would celebrate in private with her family, which grew larger through the decades as she became a great-grandmother. Normally the weather was good and they would be underneath the plane tree in the gardens having an enormous birthday luncheon, which went on for some time. Long lunches were a staple of the Queen Mum's Clarence House life all year round. Nobody, I don't think, ever turned down an invitation to lunch at Clarence House. So she was always able to have the sort of exciting, slightly drunken, entertaining lunches with famous people that she enjoyed. She loved John Betchman coming for lunch or Noel Coward. She liked rather camp men, uh, often gay men, because I think she felt they were more entertaining. They were like a frightfully, frightfully grand. Every day was a party in Clarence House, a lunch party, and the table would be set up in the garden. I mean, no picnic table. This was a mahogany polished table set with gold ornaments, with silver cutlery, with crystal glasses, bottles of champagne, and livery footmen. I mean, it, it wasn't a picnic. It was very, very grand. Lunch was always, always a very boozy affair. It was one occasion, it's quite a warm day in the gardens at Clarence House and she and three or four members of her staff were all having this lovely lunch. She liked an egg starter and then she had chicken and potatoes, that was her sort of favourite kind of meal and then maybe a light pudding but lots of wine. And everyone just falls asleep. Everyone just absolutely passes out or oh, sozzled in the gardens of Clarence House and her equerry sitting there thinking, do I do anything? And it was a full 35 minutes before he decided, well, I'd better ring the bell to summon the butler, which he did, and immediately they, they all woke up and just carried on the conversation, which was about World War II. <laughs> it wasn't just lunchtime that featured generous quantities of alcohol. The Queen Mum liked a different tipple for each part of the day. 
she used to have her morning sharpener about 12.15, but she called it 11s. And then if it wasn't strong enough, she'd say, just a touch more, just a touch more. The Queen Mother always wanted to know whether it was six o'clock, because at six o'clock, the sun was over the yard arm, and that was martini time. And of course, when the alcohol flowed, it, it, she did get the atmosphere. People, you know, let their hair down, they became more relaxed. She would put on jazz records, and she would dance, often with her guests. A favorite guest was the mystery writer, Dick Francis, a former champion jockey. After dinner, when the party was still going on, one or two people got up and danced. She was just on the carpet, and Her Majesty did as well. Queen Mother used to have sort of theatrical evenings when she'd invite luminaries from the theatre. So you get famous actors who, who would come to Clarence House and give readings. So it was an amazing place to be. The master of ceremonies for all the Queen Mum's entertainments was her long-serving page, William Tallon, known as Backstairs Billy. He was in charge of the domestic staff and spent much of the day by her side. He more or less was her right-hand man. He did everything for the Queen Mother. He was very, very close to her. He always knew exactly how to play it, not to be over-familiar with her, but not to be distant and frightened of her. I think above all, she knew that she could rely on him 100%. When people came to supper and they might put their hand over the glass to say, I've really had enough, Billy would, would keep pouring the bottle over their fingers so that it went into the glass, just to keep the Queen Mother company, of course. Talon lived at Clarence House in the gatekeeper's lodge next to the Mall. When he wasn't partying with the Queen Mother, he would have parties there continually, drinking her champagne with his friends. He was the most charming man. I met him at a party and I became friendly with him, so he would then invite me to his little house on the Mall. You had drinks and canopies, but the canopies were like pre-war. So William lived a little like the Queen Mother lived. He was quite controversial because the Queen Mother liked entertaining. Well. Billy liked entertaining too. <laughs> he liked entertaining a lot of his male friends and he would invite them back to Clarence House. On his nights off, he would go to Soho, which was very nearby, and his pickup line was always, look, would you like to come back to Clarence House? I work for the Queen Mother. And it, it was a brilliant pickup line because young men always responded to it. I'm told that he once had sex with one of these young men on the Queen Mother's favorite sofa. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's true. He certainly did lots of other things. Well, Billy Talent was gay at a time when homosexuality was still illegal throughout the United Kingdom. The Queen Mother was very aware of this. Clarence House became a safe space for gay members of staff like Talent. It wasn't the sort of Dickensian servant world. It was a world where they really did have a lot of fun. A great deal of drinking did go on and she turned a blind eye to it. I mean, there were always stories of, of footmen and people just being found lying on the floor, dead drunk. There was a lot of bed hopping. Not very many of the below stairs servants were heterosexual. The servants generally slept with each other. Billy Talon may have been popular with the Queen Mum, but he had made a lot of enemies amongst her senior, more aristocratic staff. There were a lot of tensions with other people within the Clarence House hierarchy who felt that Talon had overstepped or that he perhaps reveled too much in the influence that he had in the Queen Mother's household. The Queen Mother died in March 2002, aged 101. Billy Talon was told his services were no longer required. On his left, Billy Talon, page of the back stairs, who so mourned uh, the Queen Mother's death, uh, he said earlier in the week, I do hope I'm invited to the funeral. He was given just a few weeks' notice to leave his home of nearly 50 years. It was the senior staff at Clarence House who pushed William out. Prince Charles did step in to help Talon, providing him with an allowance and rent-free accommodation. But it wasn't Billy's beloved Clarence House. For Billy Talon, that was the end of the line, and he ended his days in a, a small flat somewhere in London, and rather sadly, in a, a lonely existence, I think. For Clarence House, the Queen Mother's death brought a new beginning. The days of long tipsy lunches were over. Soon, there would be a new inhabitant. When the Queen Mother died in 2002, her eldest grandson, Prince Charles, was devastated. 
they had the most wonderfully close and happy relationship. She was, quite simply, the most magical grandmother uh, you could possibly have. Before she died, the Queen Mother had made it clear she wanted Charles to become the next occupant of Clarence House. I think Charles was delighted to take over Clarence House, not only because it's a very nice house, but because it kept that deep, sentimental connection with his grandmother. The Queen Mother had not really updated the house since she moved in 50 years before. So like so many times in Clarence House's history, it needed a full renovation before Charles could move in. He had to get rid of the asbestos, redo the wiring, put new lifts in, make it serviceable. But he wanted to keep suddenly the soul, the spirit of his beloved grandmother. He was determined that he wasn't going to throw out her furnishings and tapestries and her threadbare carpets. They were refurbished, which is very, very King Charles. Everything's refurbished. It's still very much the Queen Mother's home that was inherited by her grandson. Charles may have kept Clarence House looking like it did in his grandmother's day, but daily life in the house changed dramatically. Gone were the cocktails at noon and long lunches under the plane tree. Charles is a martinet, absolute workaholic. Everything has to be done but minute by minute. After breakfast, Charles is busy with his royal duties and generally doesn't stop for lunch. Then he'll have supper either with friends or a state visit or an engagement. And he'll have a martini, perhaps. He does like a, a martini, shaken, not stirred. And then he'll keep on working into the night. When Charles moved into Clarence House in 2003, it also became the London residence of his then long-term girlfriend, Camilla Parker Bowles. In many ways, the story of the relationship of Charles and Camilla is told through Clarence House. They move there to signal very much the sense that they are going to marry, that this is the future of the family, of the future of the monarchy. A series of joint photo opportunities, a public kiss. Camilla being in Clarence House was, being, was very important. She wasn't hidden away like some secret mistress. He wanted her by his side. Two years later, in 2005, Charles and Camilla were married in Windsor. Now the Duchess of Cornwall, Camilla found Clarence House to be the perfect location for many of her new royal duties. Every year at Christmas, Camilla's made a tradition now of inviting quite a number of children from the local hospice. It's a wonderful occasion and they come along and help dress the tree. Camilla loves it, the children love it. It feels, because Clarence House feels like a home, it feels very warm and, and, and lovely. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles at home. In April 2011, Clarence House once again played a starring role in a royal wedding when Prince William spent the night before his marriage there, dining with his father and brother. They had this dinner and William was nervous, so he had quite a bit to drink. And then he heard all the crowds outside and says, let's go outside. I remember everyone was very surprised. That was quite a surreal moment. It was an echo of his mother 30 years before. She'd stayed there before her wedding to Charles. But fortunately for William, it was a much more happy experience. After the ceremony, William and Catherine returned to Clarence House in style to change into their evening finery. I think for them, it's got a, a real special place in their relationship. Clarence House was also the setting of an important moment in Prince Harry's relationship with Meghan Markle. Harry had decided the time had come that Meghan was introduced to Daddy, or Pa as he calls him, and to Camilla. And so it was arranged there'd be a tea at Clarence House. When Harry writes about taking Meghan there for the first time, we get a glimpse of what you and I might feel going to Clarence House, because we see it from Meghan's viewpoint. And she's absolutely entranced by the gardens. They had a cup of tea. Camilla loves dogs. Meghan loves dogs. They talked a lot about dogs. Harry did say that he'd feared there was a moment when Meghan was going to hug Charles. And uh, he said, Pa is not, is not a hugger. Throughout its 200-year history, Clarence House has been home to many senior members of the royal family, including three sovereigns. Its first occupant, King William IV, Queen Elizabeth II and King Charles III, who ascended the throne in September 2022 at the age of 73. 
There are these interesting parallels between Charles III and William IV. Both came to the throne very late in life, the oldest men to come to the throne. Both were Navy men and both loved Clarence House. And just like William IV, Charles does not seem keen to move to Buckingham Palace now he's king. None of the royals really like Buckingham Palace. It's too big, it's too cold, it's too imposing. It's not really a family home. The official word is that Charles and Camilla will move there eventually. Fortunately, perhaps, Buckingham Palace is undergoing extensive renovations and the earliest they can move in will be 2027. This gives Charles and Camilla time to think, how can we get out of moving into Buckingham Palace when it's ready? I don't think they'll ever move into Buckingham Palace. You don't want to live above the office at that age. You don't want your food coming half a mile down a corridor. Whether Clarence House becomes available soon or many years in the future, who might be the next occupant of this favourite royal residence? It was going to go to Harry and Meghan. Now, I cannot see Harry and Meghan ever coming back from the US to live in Clarence House. However beautifully, Meghan might decorate it in West Coast America neutrals. Logically, I suppose we might expect that uh, William and Catherine would move into Clarence House, but they already have quite a few homes and they have a base at Kensington Palace. I expect it will be William's children's London base. When they're young people in their 20s, they'll be living in Clarence House. So the old days of William and Harry having fun, I think we'll see them again with George and Charlotte and Louis. I think that as long as there's a British monarchy, Clarence House will be one of its favourite London homes. It's such a fascinating house because people have put their personal stamp on it. And this is not a monument of the imposing image of monarchy. It's about what life is really like behind the mask. And so what its next iteration is, uh, I can't wait to see. To many members of the public, Clarence House will always be the home of its longest and most beloved resident. For anybody of a certain age, when we think of Clarence House, we think of the Queen Mother. Although she moved in only four years after Elizabeth and Philip's renovation, the Queen Mother completely redecorated Clarence House, making it look much as it does today. Gone were the fitted carpets and in came Persian rugs with gilded furniture very often. You could tell that this was a grand house for a grand lady. The Queen Mother added double doorways between the reception rooms to make it easier to host large numbers of guests. And when Princess Margaret moved out, she knocked two of her daughter's rooms together to create the garden room, where she often entertained important visitors. The Queen Mother very much wanted to keep her finger on the button of world affairs and domestic affairs. And so when she moved into Clarence House, it became a tradition that on the first day of a state visit, an incoming president or whatever would go around for tea, tea and buns with the Queen Mother at Clarence House. One of the Queen Mother's favourite state visits took place in 1996 when President Nelson Mandela called for tea at Clarence House. They apparently ended up talking so long over tea that President Mandela and the Queen Mother were late for every other event in the itinerary that day. Queen Elizabeth wouldn't have dared scold her mother for delaying the visit. She was very influential over her daughter because she was such a strong character. Everything was light and frothy and entertaining, but underneath it, there was a woman of steel. As Clarence House was the Queen Mother's home, as well as a stage for her public duties, she made sure it reflected her personal interests. Horse racing was a massive part of the Queen Mother's life. She absolutely loved it. She started as quite a young woman, collecting paintings and drawings of horses. So she created a corridor in Clarence House with all... Kakahodo, Kansita, Kasusin, 
มอสก,ก้าโนฟามูฟาตารุมารุกวาซาวันิเมตาวันิเมลาคาร์เซมาลาซานิกาเตกิกาเตชินโนกุกาวะซิงคาคุโนกิมาซาโมโตโซกิกาคาโดซานิกาคาเบซานิกาคาโด Featured generous quantities of alcohol, the Queen Mum liked a different tipple for each part of the day. She used to have her morning sharpener about 12:15, but she called it 11s's. And then if it wasn't strong enough, she'd say, "Just a touch more, just a touch more." The Queen Mother always wanted to know whether it was six o'clock because at six o'clock the sun was over the yard arm, and that was martini time. And of course. When the alcohol flowed, it, it, she did get the atmosphere. People, you know, let their hair down. They became more relaxed. She would put on jazz records, and she would dance often with her guests. A favourite guest was the mystery writer Dick Francis, a former champion jockey. After dinner, when the party was still going on, one or two people got up and danced. I was just on the carpet, and Her Majesty did as well. Queen Mother used to have sort of theatrical evenings when she'd invite luminaries from the theatre. So you get famous actors who who would come to Clarence House and give readings. So it was an amazing place to be. The master of ceremonies for all the Queen Mum's entertainments was her long-serving page, William Tallon, known as Backstairs Billy. He was in charge of the domestic staff and spent much of the day by her side. He more or less was her right-hand man. He did everything for the Queen Mother. He was very, very close to her. He always knew exactly how to play it, not to be over-familiar with her, but not to be distant and frightened of her. I think above all, she knew that. She could rely on him 100%. When people came to supper and they might put their hand over the glass to say, "I've really had enough," Billy would would keep pouring the bottle over their fingers so they went into the glass, just to keep the Queen Mother company, of course. Talon lived at Clarence House in the Gatekeeper's Lodge next to the Mall. When he wasn't partying with the Queen Mother, he would have parties there continually, drinking her champagne with his friends. He was the most charming man. I met him at a party, and I became friendly with him. So he would then invite me to his little house on the Mall. 
you had drinks and canopies, but the canopies were like pre-war. So William lived a little like the Queen Mother lived. He was quite controversial because the Queen Mother liked entertaining. Well, Billy liked entertaining too. <laughs> he liked entertaining a lot of his male friends and he would invite them back to Clarence House. On his nights off, he would go to Soho, which was very nearby, and his pickup line was always, look, would you like to come back to Clarence House? I work for the Queen Mother. And it, it was a brilliant pickup line because young men always responded to it. I'm told that he once had sex with one of these young men on the Queen Mother's favourite sofa. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's true. He certainly did lots of other things. Well, Billy Talent was gay at a time when homosexuality was still illegal throughout the United Kingdom. The Queen Mother was very aware of this. Clarence House became a safe space for gay members of staff like Talent. It wasn't the sort of Dickensian servant world. It was a world where they really did have a lot of fun. A great deal of drinking did go on and she turned a blind eye to it. I mean, there were always stories of, of footmen and people just being found lying on the floor, dead drunk. There was a lot of bed hopping. Not very many of the below stairs servants were heterosexual. The servants generally slept with each other. Billy Talon may have been popular with the Queen Mum, but he had made a lot of enemies amongst her senior, more aristocratic staff. There were a lot of tensions with other people within the Clarence House hierarchy who felt that Talon had overstepped or that he perhaps reveled too much in the influence that he had in the Queen Mother's household. The Queen Mother died in March 2002, aged 101. Billy Talon was told his services were no longer required. On his left, Billy Talon, page of the back stairs, who so mourned uh, the Queen Mother's death. Uh, he said earlier in the week, I do hope I'm invited to the funeral. He was given just a few weeks' notice to leave his home of nearly 50 years. It was the senior staff at Clarence House who pushed William out. Prince Charles did step in to help Talon, providing him with an allowance and rent-free accommodation. But it wasn't Billy's beloved Clarence House. For Billy Talon, that was the end of the line, and he ended his days in a, a small flat somewhere in London, and rather sadly, in a, a lonely existence, I think. For Clarence House, the Queen Mother's death brought a new beginning. The days of long tipsy lunches were over. Soon, there would be a new inhabitant.